excited to hear them sing together. They've never sung together before. No. What happens if you can't carry a tune together? What are we going to do then? We need a big choir here. Sing loud. So can, can these people sing along with you? Okay. Well, in case, in case they're not any good, sing loud, okay? Very loud. Okay, bless you. Um, okay, let's open a prayer, but everybody needs to stand up so you'll be louder. All right. All right, we're going to work for you guys to really look at the Lord. The words are going to be up there, and you don't look at us, you look at the Lord. And Okay, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for you inhabit the praise of the people. Amen. We pray that you inhabit our praise tonight. And just come... As we come to you, you come to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's worship. Hallelujah, 
Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising. I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes Hallelujah. me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing.
it's running after me. Yes, your goodness is running after. It's running after me. My life laid down. I surrender now and give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Sing that again. You're good. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Put my life lay down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me.
Thank you, Lord, for this time. Now open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. Yes, Lord. Thank you, ladies. Hey, good to see you. And uh, uh, tomorrow, just an announcement. Tommy will be sharing in the pulpit here tomorrow. And... Uh, you're all invited to stay after lunch. We have a, a great lunch afterwards. This is a, a bonus month because those of you around here, this is the second carry-in we've had this, this month. I can't remember the last time I heard Bill Fetter. Uh, I think uh, Dave Lehman, a, a mutual friend of ours, said, you got to listen to this guy. <clears throat> so I, I got a video or a tape or something. I, Oh my goodness, this guy, he knows what he's talking about. His, his depth of the history of our nation and the applications are just fantastic. So uh, I thought, boy, when I have the opportunity to have him, I, I, I want to have him. Well, we scheduled him two or three years ago. He's supposed to be here live, but COVID hit, and so we, we live streamed him in. So it's nice to have him here live and in person, and he is a sought-after speaker. He, he's a man in demand, and uh, we're just blessed to have Bill Fetter. Bill. Well, thank you, Pastor Joe and uh, Peggy. And wasn't that tremendous praise and worship? And yes, I just felt the presence of the Lord, uh, Julie and Jose, and uh, who was the other singer? I forgot. What? Amy. Amy, did I get it right? Okay, and um, and Dave Lehman is a great friend, and he I don't know did he teach at Purdue, but um, he uh, he like designed uh, fighter jets for, for them. He's like really really smart. He's like you know way up here. I keep telling him you need to write books. You need to, you got so much stuff up there. Uh, it was a tremendous honor uh, being here with uh, Tommy Ice and with uh, Don Perkins and Don Stewart and. So uh, hopefully I'll say something tonight that makes it worth your while coming out. I believe so. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about a book called Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present. And the subtitle is How the Deep State Capitalizes on Crises to Consolidate Control. So we talked about this morning how the most common form of government in world history is kings. And as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people until finally the king of England was the biggest. He was a globalist, a one world government guy. And so uh, democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of the king, give it to the people. What's the difference? Democracy, like Athens, had 6,000 citizens and everybody every day had to go to the marketplace to talk what's happening and how to fix their city up. And so um, a rep it was very time consuming. Every day you had to be there. And if you didn't keep up with what they're talking about today, you're called an idiotus. <laughs> an idiot. He didn't know what we're talking about. Right? So it, it was every day you had to spend all your day long, every single day, in and out, going there. What are we talking about today? What are we talking about today? Um, and it could only get as large as a city because you physically had to be there every day. So the Greeks called them city states. And, uh, but a republic is where you could take care of your family and your farm and have someone in your place go to the market every day. They are called your representative. 
Easy to remember the REP in the word republic is basically the same REP in the word representative. So Republican form of government, you're still the king. You're just ruling through representatives or de dem for a pure democracy. You physically have to be there. But again, the kings is the most common. Democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of the king, give it to the people. But what if the king wants the power back? Does he just ask for it? Hi, um, I'm visiting your democracy and republic, and I, I want to be king, so give me control of your life. Oh, sure, I was waiting for you. Here you go. Is that how it worked? No. So there's two ways in which the king can take the power back. One is fear. When people get afraid, they will trade freedom for security. And the second is free stuff. <laughs> the king's so nice, he's giving you free stuff until you get dependent, and then he, you incrementally give up your freedom to keep the free stuff coming. It's like a drug dealer takes over a neighborhood two ways. He comes in with guns and gets everybody in fear, and you submit to the mob, and agree to pay protection money in exchange for being left alive. But the other is free stuff. The drug dealer's so nice, he's giving away free drugs until you get hooked. And then you want some more free drugs? You're going to give up your freedom and sell yourself into prostitution, right? It's sort of like a hunter catches animals through guns or bait. Sort of a front door, back door approach. Now, the bait part, I was reading How to Catch Pigs in the Wild. <laughs> and you put a post in the ground and throw some corn down. And the next day, there's two posts, and you throw some corn on it. Next day, three posts and four posts, and you start putting them in a little semicircle and put in the fencing, and, and the pigs keep coming to eat. And so finally, there's just a little opening, and the pigs come and squeeze through, and they're eating the corn, and you shut the gate, and you caught yourself some wild pigs. Right? And so that's the idea. You get people dependent, and then you incrementally, they'll give up their freedoms. Scriptures, uh, Proverbs 29, 25, fear a man bringeth a snare. So snare is a trap. Whenever you feel yourself getting afraid, you are about to be trapped. That's why the Bible says fear not. Over and over again, fear not, fear not. Do not be dismayed. Uh, the Lord your God goes with you, right? When Jesus calmed the, uh, uh, rebuked the storm, he turned around and rebuked the apostles. Oh, you little faith, you know? And, uh, and he rose from the dead, and he, the one gospel says that he, walks into the room, and he upbraids them for their unbelief. I mean, could you imagine? Here they are, Jesus rises from the dead, and he balls them out. <laughs> he upbraids them for, you know. Um, and so, uh, so, so the opposite of fear is faith. And so the Bible keeps talking about fear, and God keeps wanting to get us into faith. And so the second scripture is free stuff. Uh, James 1.15, but every man when he is tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So you get somebody lusting, and then they get trapped and enticed. So let's talk about the fear. Um, how do you create an atmosphere of fear to get people afraid so they'll trade their freedom for security? You have to sow discord. When there's unity and peace, um, you're not afraid. But if there's discord, then there's an unsettledness and insecurity, and that's when people get into fear. And so some scriptures, Psalms 133 says, How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Everybody say unity. And Proverbs 6 says, Six things the Lord hates, the last is he that soweth discord. Everybody say discord. So imagine being in heaven, and somebody sows discord. Well, it happened. Lucifer, <laughs> right? The word devil in Greek is diabolos, which means to divide. And uh, there can only be one will in heaven. It's God's will. It's a good will. He made you. He loves you. He wants to spend eternity with you and bless you. And the moment that Satan, Lucifer said, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend to the mountains of the Lord. I will put my throne higher than Five times he says, I will. And so we have two wills going on, right? And they're conflict because they're not the same will. So there's conflict. There's war. There's war in heaven. And Lucifer's cast out. And then he goes and he sows discord in the garden and gets Adam to blame Eve. And then he sows discord and gets Cain to kill Abel. And so this sowing of discord, um, we see with the uh, period of the Hebrew Republic. So this is that year period before King Saul. And you have Gideon. He defeats 100,000 Midianites. And there's no threat to Israel. But Gideon has an illegitimate son named Abimelech. He wants power. And so he's the first one to do critical race theory, <laughs> identity race politics. He goes to the town of Shechem, and he says, is it better for you that all the sons of Gideon reign over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. 
Say, forget whether or not I'm good at ruling. I'm one of you. Identify with me on a fleshly level. And his brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said he is our brother. We've got to vote for him, right? He's, he's the same flesh as we are. And then they go to the city treasury, the temple of Balbarith, and they take money to hire protesters and rioters, like Antifa, BLM type, right? And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Balbarith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and worthless persons which followed him. To do what? To do violence. And they went into his father's house and slew his brethren, and the men of Shechem made Abimelech king. So here you have a country completely at peace. There are no threats to it. They just defeated 100,000 Midianites, and somebody on the inside sows discord. Right? And he hires these rioters. Now, the Hebrew Republic would have ended here rather than a century later with King Saul had not someone threw a millstone over the wall and it killed Abimelech. Anyway, so let's look at another example. Italy, 500 years ago, it was a bunch of city-states. Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena, and they always fought. And Machiavelli thought, you know, if one prince could control all of Italy, it would stop the infighting. So he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocates the ends, justifies the means. The end of one prince controlling all of Italy is such a good end, because it'll stop the infighting, that any means necessary to get there is justified. Lie, cheat, steal. So if a prince conquers a city, the people in the city would hate him. But if the prince pays criminals, like Abimelech did, to kill cows, burn barns, smash windows, the people will cry out for help. And the prince will come in, get rid of the, rid of the very criminals he bribed to create the mess, those rioters, those Antifa type people, and then everyone will praise the prince as a hero. So it's good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house and set it on fire, and then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher. And they'll pay anything for it and even thank you for being there. Right? And so it's called Machiavellianism, where you create or capitalize on a crisis to consolidate control. You know that quote a little bit more recently with Rahm Emanuel, who said, you don't ever want a crisis to go to waste. It's an opportunity to do important things that you would otherwise avoid. And so Fox primetime Ben Dominich, Rahm Emanuel's famous dictum, never let a crisis go to waste. Normal times don't produce the outcomes that the authoritarian left once because people are not scared enough to give them the limitless power they crave. Crises are necessary. And so if there aren't any on offer, they manufacture them. Right? So you and I see a crisis. Our response is, how can we help people through it? They see a crisis. Their response is, how can we usurp power through it? Henry Louis Mencken wrote, the urge to save humanity is almost always only a false face for the urge to rule it. And um, so we're talking about sowing discord in heaven, right? Lucifer sowing discord in the garden and sowing discord with Abimelech and Machiavelli sowing discord to uh, use the crises to get people to give up. Now let's look at the British Empire. It became the biggest empire on planet Earth. The king of England was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy with him at the top. India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica. How did they get so big? Did they just walk into a country and say, hi, we want to be the biggest empire on planet Earth. Uh, give me control of your country. Okay, here are the keys. Is that how it happened? Well, let's look at how the British took over India. In 1714, they landed in Bengal and opened a trading post that turned into a trading fort that turned into them having guns. And they would give guns to one kingdom and give guns to another kingdom and then stir up discord between the kingdoms. And they would break out and fight each other and bloody each other up. And when they weakened each other, the British would come in and conquer both kingdoms. And they did this again and again and again until they took over all of India, a quarter of the world's population. And they did it in Africa and Uganda and all these different countries. They'd come in, they'd see all the different tribes, and they'd figure out which ones are the victims, which ones are oppressors, and they'd hit them against each other. And then in the bloodshed, they would come in to restore order and take over both. They tried doing this in America during the Revolutionary War. The Indians and the Americans had reached an equilibrium, right? They got through the French and Indian War. They were sort of at an equilibrium. And the British come into the Indians and stir them up and sow discord 
and promise them money for scalps. And so you got this uh, Johnny Burgoyne, the general of, for the British, meets with the Mohawk Indians, right? And they go in front of the American army, or the British army, and scalp Americans. And then come back in, they were there doing their scalp dance and everything. It was so bad that it's listed in the, the Declaration of Independence as one of the reasons, one of the 27 reasons we were rebelling against the king. The king has excited domestic insurrections among us. He's so on this discord. He, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. That's in our declaration. The British did it again during the War of 1812. So the British controlled Pensacola, Florida. And just north of Pensacola is Fort Mims, Alabama, and the Red Stick Creek Indians. Do you know the French pronunciation of Red Stick? Baton Rouge, right? Baton Rouge. And so the British go to the Red Stick Creek Indians and promise them money for scalps. And so they capture Fort Mims, Alabama, and they take all 500 of the captured and scalp them. And the, here's the historical marker. Fort Mims, here, Creek Indian War, 1813-14, took place the most brutal massacre in American history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but about 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British at Pensacola in this phase of the War of 1812. Do we really think the British cared about the Red Stick Creek Indians? No, they were coming in, sowing discord. Why? Because they wanted to take over all of it. And so this idea of going in, finding groups, pitting them against each other, it was turned into a nice, neat equation by Hegel. And so Napoleon conquers Europe, and the king of Prussia said, we can't get conquered that easy again. We need to strengthen the state. And so the philosopher to help out is Hegel, teaches at the University of Berlin. He influenced Darwin, and one of his students was Karl Marx, a member of the Young Hegelians. And so Hegel turned that into a nice, neat triangle. One corner is a thesis, the opposite corner is an antithesis or antithesis, and the top corner is a synthesis. It sounds complicated, but it's not. So Marx said the thesis is the status quo. It's the way things have been for a long time. Everybody's gotten used to it. You have to create an antithesis. You have to create discord. You have to create a problem that's really bad and makes everybody panic and fear so they'll be willing to give up some of their freedoms to the state to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And then that becomes the new starting point, and they create another crisis that's real bad, and everybody panics and fear and gives up some more of their freedom to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And then they create another antithesis, another problem that's real bad, and everybody panics in fear and gives up some more of their freedoms to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And every time they settle, the power is going from the individual to the state. And so this um, idea is how do you create a discord? How do you create a problem that's real bad? Karl Marx had it, so you sent in agitators agent provocateurs, community organizers, labor organizers, their job is to find people with grievances and stir them up to riot. Like Abimelech got people, like Machiavelli got people. You stir them up to riot, and when everybody panics in fear, they want someone to come along and restore order, and that's when you usurp power and take the rights away from the people and con consolidate it. And so Karl Marx called this critical theory. So you would go into a country and observe all the groups ethnically, religiously, economically, racially, and you would label them as victims and oppressors, haves and have-nots, and then you would stir them up to riot. And when the crisis got bad enough, everyone would be willing to surrender their freedoms to the government to, to bring security. And so at first it was organized in the proletariat against the bourgeois, which is the working class against the business owners. And then they would organize the poor against the rich, the blacks against the whites, the Catholics against the Protestants, the Muslims against the Christians, even the Hutus against the Tutsis in the Congo and Rwanda. The people in the Congo and Rwanda saw themselves as one. But the Belgian and German colonizers came in and would measure them and their features, and they would say, you're a Hutu and you're a Tutsi. Would even make them go down and register with the government as a Hutu or a Tutsi. And then they pitted them against each other 
and stirred it up so they would riot and genocide each other. And then when there's enough bloodshed, the colonizing power could come in and say, we're going to restore order, and they would take over this weakened country. And uh, the Black Lives Matter founder, Patrice Culler, said, we are trained Marxists. Now, Castro said, the revolution needs the enemy. The revolutionary needs his antithesis, which is the counter-revolutionary. And if enemies were lacking, they had to be fabricated. In other words, you can't get your side to get stirred up into fear where they'll give up their freedom to settle for an answer that's half as bad unless there's an enemy to be afraid of. And if there's no enemy, you, you fabricate them. You know, you just make one up out of nothing, like a, a white supremacist or a Christian nationalist or something that doesn't exist, but you want to make it into the enemy. Why? Because then you can have an excuse to take over the military and take over everything and get rid of everybody because we've got this hidden enemy there. And then when you panic and fear, you can usurp power and put in your dictatorship. Jesus talked about this. He said, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And Lincoln gave an address called, A House Divided Against Itself Cannot Stand. It's like introducing an autoimmune disease into the body politic. What's an autoimmune disease? It's where your own immune system starts attacking your own organs. You have a war going on inside your own body. So what do they do? They go into the body politic, and they get it to attack itself inside of the body. Does this make sense? So how do you destroy a marriage? So discord. How do you destroy a family? So discord. How do you destroy a church? So discord. How do you destroy a country? So discord. So critical race theory is patriotism is the enemy. You get people to stop identifying as patriots of the country. You get them to identify with subgroups, and you pit the subgroups against each other. And um, Franklin Roosevelt said... Whoever seeks to set one nationality against another seeks to degrade all nationalities. Whoever seeks to set one race against another seeks to enslave all races. FDR said, remember the Nazi technique, pit race against race, religion against religion, prejudice against prejudice, divide and conquer. I, uh, you know how you, you, uh, you drive a, a new car and you see everybody else driving that new car, right? And so when you're uh, writing books and doing study and on a topic, you start noticing other quotes on the same topic. And so I saw this quote. This is NBA player Charles Barkley, CBS Sports Panel, April 3rd, 2021. He said, man, I think most white people and black people are great people. I really believe that in my heart. But I think our system is set up where our politicians whether they're Republicans or Democrats, are designed to make us not like each other so they can keep their grasp of money and power. They divide and conquer. We're so stupid following our politicians. Now, there are a few good ones, um, but he says their job is, hey, let's make the whites and blacks not like each other. Let's make the rich people and the poor people not like each other. Let's scramble the middle class. I truly believe this in my heart. Right. So here we have this uh, uh, breaking the country into groups and pitting them against each other for a political purpose. Now, getting a little more closer to the present, you have Saul Alinsky. He rode around in Chicago with Al Capone's hitman, Frank Nitti. And he saw how all the mob had to do was kill a few people, smash a few windows, and everyone in the neighborhood would panic in fear and submit to the mob and pay extortion protection money. And so Saul Alinsky says, let's apply this to politics. And uh, it affected uh, former President Obama was a community organizer with the Alinsky people in Chicago. And Hillary Clinton wrote her senior thesis at Wellesley College on Saul Alinsky. I actually spoke for uh, Paul, Paul Campbell at the West Main High School in Chicago. Six different history classes. This was several decades ago. And as you know, the old wooden desks and the radiators by the window and the really high ceilings with every type of patriotic thing that you could think of, you know, how those old classrooms were. And after the sixth class, I talk, taught all day long. Uh, he goes over to the window and, point, and points at a desk and he goes, you know who sat in this desk? Hillary Rodham, right? Hillary Rodham Clinton, but this was, but, and he, he, he said, she was a conservative back then. She was in my class. She was a Goldwater girl, and then she went off to this college, which was Wellesley, and it says she got mixed up with a pinko Methodist preacher, 
And uh, then she be, went on to the left. But, uh, but that's where she got introduced to Saul Alinsky. So she did her th senior thesis on Saul Alinsky. There's nothing left but the fight. So Saul Alinsky says, the first step in community organization is community disorganization. Disruption of the present organization is the first step. The organizer's first job is to create the issues or the problems. The organizer must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. The organizer polarizes the issue and helps lead his forces into conflict. He must search out controversy, for unless there is controversy, the people are not concerned enough to act. And in the front of his book, he has an acknowledgment to Lucifer. I have a copy of the book right there. It says, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgment to the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively, he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. Here we are starting off the whole thing with Lucifer sowing discord in heaven, sowing discord in the garden, getting Adam to blame Eve and Cain to kill Abel, and sowing discord with Abimelech right? Stirring up an Israel that was completely at peace to fight itself on the inside. And then you have Machiavelli sowing discord, and you have the, um, the British Empire, and then you have uh, Hegel uh, and Karl Marx sowing discord. And, and so here we have Solinsky sowing discord, right? So this is the politics that we have been experiencing here in America. And they're wanting to take it from a national level to a global level, sowing discord. And um, uh, so they're basically taking the Cold War tactics that have been used by the KGB and the CIA in other countries. So after World War II, you had a whole bunch of new countries coming into, uh, into existence after the war. And they elected brand new leaders with their new little republics. And the Soviet Union's like, we want to get control of those. So they would go into those countries and do their critical race theory, identify all the groups, Bosnians, Croats, Serbs, right? Ethnically, economically, racially, Sunni, Shia, whatever it is. And, and they would pit them against each other as victims and oppressors. And they would co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame the new leader of the new country for all the problems. And when the country got panicky enough because of the violence and they're blaming the leader enough, they would do a coup or a rigged election and replace the leader with a Soviet puppet. And they did this again and again and again. And Truman does nothing because he thinks the United Nations that he helped form will bring world peace. But the next president's Eisenhower. And in 1953, Iran sides with the Soviet Union, their leader Mazadek, and uh, he nationalizes the oil industry in Iran. You think, what does that mean? Well, in 1908, Britain formed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. You know it better as BP, British Petroleum. Winston Churchill changed the whole British Navy from coal to oil, and so they needed oil, and so they started this Anglo-Iranian oil company, which turned into BP. And during this 1953, he takes it all, and he's now siding with the Soviet Union. And so Britain goes to Eisenhower, says help. Eisenhower approves the first CIA operation to overthrow a country's leaders, Operation Ajax. And they send over Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, and he's the CIA operative on the ground. And he does the KGB thing in reverse. He gets mobsters and gangsters and radical imams, and they stage protests and riots and attack mosques, and they co-opt the media with bribes and threats to blame Mazadek for all the problems. And when the country hates him enough because of the violence, that's when they go in, put Mazadek under house arrest, lock him away for the rest of his life where he dies, and they replaced him with the Shah. And the Shah loved America because we put him in. And the CIA did the same thing in Guatemala, in the Dominican Republic, in the Congo. And the KGB did the same thing with Brezhnev and Khrushchev helping Yasser Arafat to start the PLO to do, to do what? So division in the Middle East. And Brezhnev and Khrushchev helping Castro to sow division, take over Cuba, and help uh, start FARC in Colombia and ELN in Bolivia. Why? To go in, identify the groups, pit them against each other, create this chaos, and in the confusion, blame the leader, and then put in a pu Soviet puppet. Or in our case, we'd flip it. And, and that's basically the theme for most spy movies. Right? James Bond, you know, they go to a country, and they're, oh, this is the, the KGB, and there's the CIA, and they're going to do an assassination. <laughs> and they're gonna, all right? Except now we see those exact things done on our own soil. 
the going in, identifying groups, pitting them against each other, and then fanning it into a flame with the media, and then using it as an excuse. And one of the things they do, it's called psychological projection. Sigmund Freud coined the term. It's where the attacker blames the victim. It's called blame shifting. It's in the Bible. Potiphar's wife was lusting after Joseph, but she accused Joseph of lusting after her. Right? You accuse others of what you're guilty of. Uh, narcissists do this, this blame shifting. Little kids do it. I didn't start the fight. You did. A cheating spouse will accuse the faithful spouse of being unfaithful. Right? And they do it every day, and they do it against you. They call you hateful when they're hateful. They call you intolerant when they're intolerant. They call you divisive when they're divisive. They accuse you of wanting to overthrow the country when they're wanting to overthrow the country. They accuse you of voter fraud when they did the voter fraud. It's, it's a tactic that's used all over. So David Axelrod was Obama's campaign advisor, and he said, NPR Radio, April 19th, 2010. He said, in Chicago, there was an old tradition of throwing a brick through your own campaign office window and then calling a press conference to say you've been attacked. You do the attack, and you blame your innocent opponent for it. Why? Because their name gets associated with it in the media. It keeps getting repeated, 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 and people make a subconscious connection. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And if it ever gets pointed back at them, by that time, the water's muddied. The public doesn't know who to trust. They've already made up their mind, and they get a pass. And so let's say there's a candidate running for president, and she's colluding with Russia, giving away a fifth of the U.S. uranium, in exchange for a $145 million contribution to her Clinton Foundation, what does she do? She pays for a steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. And if she gets caught, she just pays a $113,000 fine to the FEC. Let's say there's another candidate that is extorting Ukraine, saying, stop investigating my son Hunter, or I'm going to hold back billions of dollars of U.S. aid. Well, you want to accuse your opponent of extorting Ukraine. Um, let's say there's a, uh, a, a leader, a, a president, and they find out that he has um, government uh, classified records in his garage. And they know that it's going to become public. Well, what do they do? They want to preempt the story from going to the public by raiding Mar-a-Lago and seizing some papers. Why? So that it'll get in the headlines. Trump's got classified papers that he shouldn't have. And everybody in their mind, classified papers, Trump, classified papers, Trump, classified papers. And then they just start, slip the story in there. Oh, Biden had classified papers. And well, that time, it's, it's no longer a story. And, and he gets a pass. I even think that they knew about Hunter Biden's laptop a long time ago. And they knew he was fooling around with Russian prostitutes and everything. And I think that's why they even introduced that story in the first place of Trump fooling around. Right? So that's what they do. They accuse you of what they're guilty of. And uh, I was recently uh, at a state where they were talking about how uh, they were wanting to push a transgender thing. And this uh, activist le legislator said, who in this room is going to take responsibility for all these kids that are going to commit suicide unless you reaffirm them in their transgender stuff. Would you rather have a live uh, transgender child or a dead child that's whatever? And they want to acclaim, accuse you of causing these kids to become suicidal when the actual evidence is it's the teaching of the transgendered agenda that makes these kids suicidal. They're guilty of it, but they want to accuse you of it. And so we have to understand that this has gotten into politics, but it even goes a little bit further. Um, it's something called false flags. And uh, that comes from the pirates. I spoke a couple weeks ago in Beaufort, North Carolina, right on the Outer Banks area. And that's where Blackbeard and uh, the Queen Anne's Revenge and the one couple that drove me around, he was in charge of the museum there and was telling me all the, the cool stories and and so he says the, the pirates really didn't want to get into a fight because they didn't want to get wounded because they didn't really have hospitals. And so they wanted to shock and awe you. They wanted to surprise you and freak you out so that you would just panic. So what they would do is they would raise a false flag, maybe a flag of a friendly nation in distress. And so your boat would say, hey, there's a friendly nation in distress. Let's, let's go over and, get, and help them. And you, they would get closer, and then when they got 
close enough where they couldn't get away fast enough, they would take down the friendly nation flag, put up the pirate flag, and they would come after them. And they would have, and they said Blackbeard would um, have a, a dagger in his teeth, two pistols, and he would take the wicks that you would light the cannon with, you know? He would take the wicks and light them on fire and stick them in his beard and in his hair. And the guy was like 6'6". Like I mean, he was huge. And here's this big, huge guy jumping onto the boat with his pistols and his knife and his face all smoking and everything. And everybody would just panic. And they're like, okay, don't kill me here. And they would give him all the gold and everything. And so this concept of doing something to get people into panic and so they quickly get into fear and surrender. That's this term of false flags. And so one of the first false flags was the king of Sweden. Now, in the seven, early 1700s, Sweden was a big country. They actually helped founded Norway. I mean, they, they founded Delaware and New Jersey. Those were originally Swedish colonies. So uh, the, the rising power was Russia, and the king of Sweden wanted to get into a fight with Russia, but his parliament would not approve funding. And so the king of Sweden had the tailor of the Royal Swedish Opera sew Russian uniforms and had Swedish soldiers put on the Russian uniforms and stage an attack on a Swedish outpost at Pumala. And the news spread across the country that the Russians had attacked. And the news gets into the Stockholm parliament and they're like, oh, okay. And they quickly approve the funding for the king to have war with Russia. So you could think they, they literally staged an attack against themselves for this. A similar thing happened with the Gleiwitz incident in 1939. The Nazis wanted to invade Poland. But world public opinion would never have gone along with it. And so they had Nazi soldiers dress up as Polish soldiers and attack an outpost that happened to have a radio tower. And they're giving real-time reports. The Polish are attacking. The Polish are killing. the And it goes all, all around the world. And it's an excuse for the Nazis then to invade Poland and take over. And the, um, uh, the Soviets did it in 1939 with the uh, Winter War. So in this case, the Soviets wanted to invade Finland. And world public opinion wouldn't go along with it. And so the Soviets shell a Russian village on the Finnish border and make it look like the Finnish did it. And when the word spreads, oh, the Finns had attacked the Russians, then they were, had an excuse to go in to Finland and in the Winter War. The uh, Ch Japanese did that in 1931, where they had a railroad track along the coast of China, and there was an explosion at Mukden on the railroad track. And the Japanese used this as an excuse to invade China and kill hundreds of thousands in Nanking, China. They later did an investigation, and they walked the entire length of the railroad. And uh, that's supposedly where the explosion was, <laughs> like a loose railroad spike. And you're like, they made it out of thin air. They made it up. Oh, the Japanese, blew, the Chinese blew up our railroad. We have an excuse to go in there. And they killed hundreds of thousands of people. The Turks did a similar thing. So Constantinople, the name was changed to Istanbul. But there were still some Greeks living there, Greek Christians, because it used to be the capital of the Christian world for a thousand years. And they still had this Greek Christian remnant there. But they get a fundamentalist leader named Menderes, and he wants to get rid of these Greeks. And so the plan was that he would have a Turkish university student put a bomb in the Turkish consulate, which was over in Greece, and in Ataturk's birth, birthplace. Ataturk was more or less the founding father of the Republic of Turkey. He was a secular guy, a moderate guy, and um, uh, he did not buy into the, the jihad stuff. Anyway... So the plot was for this Turkish university student to put bombs in the Turkish consulate and in Ataturk's birthplace, and the bombs never went off. But the newspapers ran with the story anyway, right? The bombs went off, and they blamed the Greeks, and so they get the whole city whipped up into a frenzy to attack the Greek neighborhoods. There was a reporter for the London Sunday Times who was there named Ian Fleming. You know him because he wrote a series of detective novels called... James Bond, 
But Ian Fleming was there. He says, hatred flowed in the streets like lava. And so they go to the Greek neighborhoods and they smash the windows and they smash the stores and they smash the churches and the graves and the Greeks are chased out. Here's this innocent group. They, they had a plot to blow it and, and the bobs never went off, but they, they stirred up the people to do this. And then more recently, Erdogan did it. So Erdogan ran for office as a moderate, and then once he gets in, he begins to make himself a dictator. He even said, democracy is like a train, said Mr. Erdogan, once you get off, once you've reached your destination. right? And so here, he does not like the anti-Erdogan movement that is growing in Turkey. And so he stages a coup against himself. Gets in an airplane, flies in a circle, claims that there were people in the military that were trying to overthrow him. And he lands and pulls out a list of all of his political opponents and has them arrested, brought before hearings, brought and zip tied and taken away, and they've not been seen since. And Stalin did a similar thing. And so Stalin in 1934 was facing a growing anti-Stalinist movement. At the same time, he had a supporter named Sergei Kirov, who was giving these speeches praising Stalin. He's wonderful, he's great. But he was getting a little too popular for Stalin's comfort. So Stalin had an idea. He would assassinate his own friend, Sergei Kirov, and eliminate a potential rival and blame the assassination on the anti-Stalinists, and everybody would believe it because the anti-Stalinists didn't like Stalin and they didn't like Sergei Kirov. So Stalin used that as an excuse to have hearings, to do investigations, to uh, interrogate, and to kill over a million people in the first great purge of 1936. And then we look at Germany. And... Uh, they were a republic, the Weimar Republic, and then someone started a party called the National Socialist Workers' Party, Then the head of it was Hitler. And it had an under-the-table violent group, sort of like a um, Abimelech hiring vain and worthless persons, sort of like Machiavelli paying people, sort of like um, the, uh, the British stirring up the Indians, right? And, and so this group was called the Brown Shirts, they were nicknamed Sturmabteilung, which means stormtroopers, because they would storm into the meetings of Hitler's opponents and disrupt the meeting. And then they would lock arms and block access to public buildings. Could you imagine people locking arms in public and blocking things? And then they would block streets. And then they went into the cities and they smashed the windows and looted and set on fire 7,500 stores in the night of broken glass. Crystal knocked. And then, oh, did I mention their capital got set on fire? The burning of the Reich, Reichstag? And um, they had an insurrection at the capital. And evidence points to Hitler's own people setting the fire, but Hitler blamed his political opponents and decided he's going to have some hearings. He's going to do some investigations. He's going to round up people, and he has them shot without a trial. And when the dust settles, Hitler didn't have any political opponents left. You know, uh, Tucker Carlson showed this uh, video of the very first people coming into the U.S. Capitol. And, uh, gee, they're all dressed in black. They seem to know where they're going, one one way, one the other. And they're wearing tactical gear. And uh, there weren't any people at the, uh, the rally for Trump that were wearing black tactical gear. And um, it looks like they knew what they were doing. And then it comes out that uh, there were FBI operatives in the crowd. And uh, then it looks like, and then there's Ray Epps. And he is on video saying we need to break into the Capitol, break into the Capitol. There's video of him moving the barricades and pushing people through. And then he's like not on the list of wanting to question. And it looks very similar to what Hitler did, what Stalin did, what Erdogan did, right? That if you're growing unpopular, there's a movement that you don't like, you stage an attack, and you blame your innocent opponents. And then you begin to do investigations, and you're going to round them all up and lock them all away. And when the dust settles, you won't have any political opponents. You know, their goal is to not have a, just a national crisis, but international. Imprimis magazine, Michael Rechtenwald had an article, what, what is a great reset, 
And he gives a quote, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum uh, and Thierry Mallard write that if the past five centuries in Europe and America have taught us anything, it is that acute crises contribute to boosting the power of the state. So the plan of the Great Reset is to have crises nationally and internationally. And in these economic crises, financial uh, health care crises, um, and the goal is to get you into fear. And when you're in fear, you panic and you'll trade your freedom for security, which again talks about the Bible saying, stay in faith, right? Don't get into fear. I was amazed. Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, and uh, he gave a talk at Stanford. Now, he is uh, not known for quoting the Bible, but this was an interesting speech. He said the zeitgeist, or the worldview on the other side, is we are not going to make it for another century on this planet. We need to embrace one world totalitarian state right now. And he, answered, he goes on, whatever the dangers are in the future, we need to never underestimate the danger of a one world totalitarian state. And then he quotes the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, the political slogan of the Antichrist is peace and safety. He ends, I want to suggest that we would do well to be a little more scared of the Antichrist and a little less scared of Armageddon. In other words, instead of being scared, oh, there's going to be, the world's going to collapse, the climate change, everything's going to be, we need to hurry up and surrender all of our power to this one guy. <laughs> He's saying, uh, we need to be a little less scared of a world crisis and more scared of the person that wants to save us from the world crisis. <laughs> Their globalist tactic is they want to get you into fear, because then when you're in fear, you'll trade your freedom for security. And the Lord's response is to fear not. Now, um, one of the stories from the Bible is uh, there's a wicked, wicked king, Manasseh, sacrificing children to Molech. And uh, the prophets come to him and said, uh, you're filling the streets of Jerusalem with the blood of these innocent children. You're doing the same thing that the Canaanites did before Israel came in. Because there's nothing more unjust than killing an innocent baby that didn't do anything wrong, and I'm a just God, right? I'm paraphrasing here. The prophets tell them that you're doing the same thing that the people that were here before Israel came in did, and because they were doing it, I brought Israel in to drive them out, and because you're doing it, I'm going to drive you out. And judgment was pronounced by the prophet. Manasseh dies, his son dies, but his grandson, Josiah, is eight years old when he becomes king. 16 years old, he starts to seek the Lord. In his early 20s, he tells him to clean out the temple that his granddad had trashed. And they're cleaning out the temple, and they find the law of God. And Josephus and some of the commentaries say that it was the last copy of the law on planet Earth because Manasseh was not just killing babies, he was burning copies of the, the law. And so it was the, supposedly the original one Moses had wrapped in burlap, and it was buried in the storage room, and they pull it out, and they, the priests had never read it before. They're like, wow, it's pretty, pretty unusual. And then they take it to the king. And obviously this, this young king had never heard it before. And when they read it to the king, you're a country that had a covenant with God. You've gotten away from God. Deuteronomy 28, blessings and cursings. And if you don't if you hearken to the voice of the Lord, these are the curses that are going to come upon you. And when he hears it for the first time, he rips his garments and repents. And then he sends messengers to a prophetess in town. Jeremiah is alive at this time, but he's prophesying someplace else. And so the, the, the prophetess's name is Huldah. And she is the wife of the king's tailor. And she says, tell the man that sent you messengers to me that judgment will come. But not during his lifetime, because he repented when he heard the words of the Lord. And so for the rest of the 31-year reign of Josiah, there's peace and prosperity in Judah. And he tears down the Sodomite temples. And he has this enormous Passover and then he sends the Levites out to teach the law everywhere. And it was during that revival that uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got saved, right, to use that terminology. And, um, and so I believe that if we rend our garments and we repent and we have a, a Josiah generation, 
that God can put it off. And when it finally happens, all the numbers will work out just right. But, um, you know, and when I read a lot of history, I see every generation has a crisis. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, bubonic plague. And the, the crisis of the generation is an opportunity for the people that are alive to respond. They can either do something or do nothing. And in a sense, it's almost like a, a mini self-sorting out of the sheep and the goats. It's not the ultimate one, but it's a small one. And, um, and so I, uh, historically, Christians have always responded. I was speaking up in, I guess, Pennsylvania. It was like a Mennonite community. And uh, a lady had a you know, group and how the ladies would wear the, the long blue, light blue and white checkered dresses and they'd have the little buns. And, and, um, and so I'm thinking, oh, these are you know, sort of simple type people. And, and the, the lady's saying, yeah, we're getting ready to go over to Syria to minister to the refugees. And I said, Syria? They're like having a war, ISIS. They're like killing people. She goes, oh, I know. Uh, and I said, well, you might die. She goes, oh, yeah, we're, we're prepared for it. She said they showed us a video of ISIS coming into a town, and they had this Christian man there, and they had the sword out, and they said, deny Christ or we'll chop your head off. He denies Christ. They chop his head off anyway and chuckle. <laughs> and she said they showed us this video so we know that we might die over there, and we're not, not going to deny Christ. I'm like, whoa, these people are spiritual. <laughs> I mean, they're like really, but historically, that's what Christians did. Whenever there was a need, boom, they would be there, right? I'm already dead. My life is hid with Christ, with God, in God. And, uh, and so it's like my, my life belongs to God, and it's where do you need me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy king, name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it's like, okay, thy will be done. Where do you need me? I'm already dead. My life is hid with Christ in God. So freshman chemistry class, the teacher has a beaker with a solution and pours in a catalyst that causes a reaction. And some stuff precipitates and gets heavy and settles to the bottom of the beaker. And other stuff gets effervescent and bubbly and floats to the top of the beaker. And so the time period we're living in is our solution in the beaker. The crisis of our time period is the catalyst that's poured in. And some people's response to the catalyst, to the crises, is going to be to precipitate and drop out, run away and hide and, and deny their faith, deny Jesus, even take the mark of the beast. How am I going to survive? I'm in fear. Oh, I, I don't want to lose my job. Okay, okay. And other people's response to the crises is to get more effervescent. Like the early church, when they were persecuted, they prayed for boldness, Right? It's like, okay, Lord, where do you need me? Let's go for it, you right? It's the same crisis that's going to cause two different reactions. And I can't help but think that God is intentionally pushing the world toward a, a decision-making moment. And so every generation has a crisis. And, uh, and if we get through this crisis, there'll be another one. If we get through that crisis, there'll be another one. Although I do see them reaching a more global level than they've ever been before and with technology and anybody that can connect the dots and such excellent prophecy teaching by, by Tommy Ice and Don Perkins and Don Stewart, you can pretty well see we're, we're, we're winding it up, right? The Lord's winding up his, his grand plan for uh, humanity. But Jesus says wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. You know, when we were... Um, when humanity, uh, when Attila the Hun was scourging Europe in the year 450 AD, he had an army of a half a million men. And he is just wiping out city after city in Europe. And uh, if we were alive at that time, that would be a pretty serious crisis. Right? An army's coming <laughs> to a half a million men, right? Genghis Khan kills 30 million people from Korea to Hungary. I mean, that would be a big crisis. The Spanish flu, Spanish flu killed, what, 75 million people? I mean, any, if we were to live any one of those crises, it was super, super serious, and now this is our turn. And I can't help but think that it's in times of crises that corrupt leaders concentrate power, right? They want to cause a crisis, so discord gets you into fear, so, you, so some people will surrender their freedom. But the flip side is it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. The same crisis is going to cause two different reactions. And... Um, and it's also in times of crises that leaders rise up. 
and you think of what are your favorite stories in the Bible? Well, Moses standing up to Pharaoh. Here's this 80-year-old guy that's totally unarmed, and all of the Israelites are unarmed, and, and, and he stands with David and Goliath and, and Gideon. We love the stories where it looks hopeless, and then God raises up nobodies to do big things. And, um, and then again, the idea of we're the bride of Christ, and every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is pushing the world to the final decision-making moment. And some people are going to choose the all others. I want to be liked and friended and followed, and I want to fit in, and I don't want anybody to say. And other people are going to say, I don't care about the all others. All I care about is Jesus. Right? It's like a cell dividing. So you're going to have those that are doing evil, and then those that are silent in the face of evil. And by their silence, they're giving consent to the evil. They're choosing sides. There ain't going to be no evil in heaven. <laughs> and if you're silent in the face of evil, you're silent giving consent, you're giving consent to evil, um, you're choosing sides. And there's other people that says, you know what, I stretched the rubber band and tolerated something I didn't feel good about, but I did it anyway. And, and then I stretched the rubber band a little bit more and tolerated something else I didn't feel good about. But I'm sorry, I can't go with giving eight-year-old girls hysterectomies. I'm sorry, I can't go with chemically castrating little boy. I, I can't go with California having a bill to kill a baby 28 days old or uh, Disney having a cartoon Antichrist or the Satan worshiping grandmas. I, I can't go there, sorry. And you cut the rubber band and say, you know what, since I don't care about what people think about me, I'm going to be more excited for Jesus than ever before, right? And so I see this division taking place. Now, um, I... Uh, was thinking about the, what I said this morning about how God created us all, right? So God is, he's totally omnipotent, all-powerful, eternal, and all just, and everything obeys him. But at some point, he said, I would really like someone in my image that could love me. And so he created us, but love, by definition, must be voluntary. And so he has to hide himself behind his creation, because if he ever showed himself in all of his omnipotent power, your response would be involuntary. In the presence of a being that makes a trillion, trillion stars, right? In his presence, you would be involuntary. And I also thought, if he allowed his love to be experienced, your response would be boom. And so it's almost like he has to tone it back. And we know it, he does, because it says in some places that he, he'll hide his face right? And, um, but then he's just, and he has to judge every sin, and his plan was that his own son would become the lamb and take the judgment for our sin. And I was thinking about the lamb, and uh, we had that beautiful song that we sang tonight about the blood of Jesus. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, the first place I saw the gospel in the Bible was uh, Adam and Eve sinned and hid from God. Have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against, right? So let's say you're talking about somebody behind their back and you're joking and making fun of them and you look up and there's that very person walking towards you. Question, are you drawn to want to go over to them? Or like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Uh, I think I'm going to slip out the back. Your own conscience does not want you to be around the person you've sinned against. So when Adam and Eve sinned, God still wanted to walk with them in the garden, but they wanted to get away. It was like two magnets that were stuck together, and one of them turns. The first one wants to touch, but the second one wants to get away. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, it's their own conscience that makes them want to stay away from God for a day, a week, a month, for eternity. And so Adam and Eve said, we blew it. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's own idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves make Adam and Eve acceptable to God? No. And then we read this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. Question, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. Something has to die. Do you think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever 
right? Creation just finished, right? This is the first thing that would have, would have died. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sinned, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear the animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it, right? They were covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, Adam and Eve are walking around wearing the skin of the animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And so Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel. Cain decides he wants to worship God, but he does an offshoot of the church of the fig leaf. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts. (laughs) Cain's is a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake and you'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Cain is bringing forth fruit out of the ground. He's sweating. He's working hard. He's trying to work his way to heaven. And he piles all of his works on the altar. Did Cain's works make him acceptable to God? No. And Abel offers the lamb. And it's this beautiful picture. God is on one side. We are on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. And the lamb takes the judgment for our sins. If you do works, you can be proud of your works. God resists the proud. But if you're trusting in the lamb, you're implicitly acknowledging you're insufficient in yourself and you need help, and you're humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so Noah offered lambs when he got off the ark. Abraham killed lambs and offered them to the Lord and split the animals in half and the ram up on the bush. And and Moses had every family in Israel kill a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost of their house. So the angel of death would pass over. What was that? Well, it's this judgment. The angel's bringing this judgment. And the blood is like, oh, we've already paid. (laughs) See the blood? The blood blood took the judgment for us. You can pass over. And the high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant, box covered with gold. Inside are the Ten Commandments. And then there's a golden lid, and then there's the two angels and the presence of the Lord between the angels. And the high priest comes in and sprinkles the blood of the atonement, the sacrifice, on the mercy seat. So it's between the presence of the Lord above and the law below. If the priest would have walked in without the blood, he would have been walking before the judgment seat of God. And the Lord would see the law, would see how they broke the law, and there would be judgment. But they sprinkled the blood of the lamb took the judgment for us, and it turned from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. And Solomon had a thousand lambs sacrificed when he dedicated the temple. Finally, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God is on one side, we are on the other side, our sins separate us from God, and the Lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, Are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you're still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you're approaching God as Cain. I hope I did a good enough good works. Maybe a couple more handfuls of barley. That'll do it. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me being good enough. It's this lamb that took the judgment that I deserved. And so why did the lamb have to die? God is just. He can't help it. It's his nature. He has to judge every sin. If he doesn't judge a sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin one time, he's denying himself. He's denying his just nature. That's the only side of God that the devil knew. So here's Lucifer, puffed up with pride in heaven. And he wants to put his throne higher than the throne of God. And God said, you've sinned against me, and he cast him out. And the devil goes into the garden and sees Adam and Eve and says, huh, If I can get them to sin against God one time, God will have to destroy them and judge them. Gets them to sin, it's pretty easy, and says, uh, ha-ha, you have to judge your creation. You have to destroy it, because if you don't judge them, you're giving consent to their sin. And if you give consent to the sin, you're no longer just God. You're you're kicked out of heaven. 
And so God sends the judgment on the sin, but in steps the lamb and takes the hit. So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. And, uh, and I mentioned it this morning, right? An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. So the God of eternity, the God of the universe, chose for this little bubble for us to exist in. He created time. You know, in the presence of the Lord, there is, it's, um, God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. For him to create our reality, he had to create this little space-time bubble where everything moves slower than now. <laughs> Right? It's called the speed of light, the speed of causality, the, the delay between cause and effect. Right? And uh, so he creates, so we're living in slow motion compared to God. And uh, why is that important? We get to make our little limited free will decisions in the context of God's sovereign will. Right? So he controls time, space, matter, energy. Right? And, uh, and we're, it says the day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as a day. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. We're living in slow motion compared to God. So we get to make our little decisions, but he can readjust every atom in the universe so that his will is going to take place. The book of Revelation is going to take place exactly the way he wrote it. It's going to take place, right? But our lives before then, we make our little decisions and he controls time. He's, he can readjust every atom so that we have this limited free will in the context of his sovereign will. Now, someday you're going to be dead and you're going to be in heaven uh, because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, imagine you've been in heaven 10,000 years and you're walking the streets of gold and, uh, and you meet Moses. I don't know what it's like in heaven, um, you know, Moses might invite you over to his place. It says in my, Jesus said in my father's house, there are many mansions, or as uh, Dr. I said, there's many dwelling places, right? And so, uh, so you get invited over to Moses' place. And maybe he'll have one of those uh, rooms, of, maybe about this size, and he'll have one of those fireplaces where the logs don't burn up. Get at the burning bush in the wilderness, didn't burn up, and the logs in his fireplace didn't burn up. I'll, I heard one preacher say, in heaven, you'll travel as fast as you think, and I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife would say, where were you? I was thinking about something else. I don't know. But imagine we all gather there. We're all in Moses' dwelling place, and um, after the small talk's over, you just can't contain yourself, and you say, Moses, what was it like? I, I read the book. I even saw the movie. But here you are in person. The room will get quiet. Moses will stand up, and he goes, I was 80 years old. And Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world, was charging in at us with these chariots and razor-sharp swords, and we were totally unarmed. And I just stood there, and I held out my staff, and I said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. And then we're going to look around the room and see David. Say, David, tell us your story. The room will get quiet. David will stand up, and he'll say, I was just a teenager. This giant thug Goliath was mocking our God and making fun of our faith, and these grown-ups were too chicken and scared to do anything. They were in fear. And I said, well, enough of that. I took my little sling, went and hit him in the head, and took his own sword and chopped his head off. And then there's going to be Gideon, 100,000 Midianites. I got 30,000 Israelites, and God said, too many. Tell everyone that's scared to go home. Great, now I'm down to 10,000. Still too many. Go drink from a creek. And he whittled it down to 300. And then God said, okay, watch this. <laughs> and we're going to go one by one around the room. We're going to hear the Apostle Paul and, and Mary and Deborah. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. Tell you, we haven't heard your story yet. What did you do when it was your turn to be down there on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? What were they saying about the Ten Commandments or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb or marriage that God himself instituted in Genesis? What did you do when the whole world was against you? What did you do when it looked hopeless? You know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and to, and to have Jesus walk in. 
And a big screen come down and him show all kinds of miracles and people coming to the Lord and all kinds of great things. And, and him saying, this is what I, had, what I had planned for you to do down on earth, but you just didn't have enough faith and courage. And you look back at your life and that mountain that held you back, it's a little anthill. The fear of man. I let the fear, but fear of man hold me back from doing all this great stuff for Jesus? What are people going to post about me on the internet? What I let that hold me back from it. And you can't go back to earth and do anything else for Jesus because you're already in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. But guess what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs. We still have feet that trod the soil. You still can do those things that you will be known for forever. Right? It's like a basketball game. And you're on the bench and Jesus is the coach. And he comes over and slaps you on the back and says, okay, your turn. Get in the game. We're in the final innings. Save the best for last. And you're like, but, but coach, they're, they're playing really tough out there. It's sort of scary. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know. It's your turn. Get in the game. I'm like, but coach, somebody just got knocked down. He goes, I know. You're seven feet tall. They're four feet tall. You can do this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Right? Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it. He's filled you with his Holy Spirit. He's given you his word. He's given you a tremendous pastor right here with Pastor Joe. God has given, this is your time to shine and do all those great things for the Lord before we all spend eternity with him in heaven. God bless you. Wow. <laughs> All I can say is, amen, praise the Lord. And uh, thank you for coming and uh, take this challenge. This is, uh, this is our time. This is, uh, this is our day. Let's, uh, let's not uh, squander these wonderful scriptures and truth that uh, has been presented by all of our speakers and capped off with Bill tonight. So, Father, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your challenge to us. And Lord, yeah, if, if not us, who? If not now, when? This is our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Travel, travel graces to you. See you tomorrow morning. Yes.